This video is all about the human immune system. It would explain how the immune system protects us against infection and how immunization aids this system. It also looks at how understanding the immune system has led to the development of monoclonal antibodies and some of the different ways these are used. The human immune system is based around white blood cells. Pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease. Our bodies have many defences to prevent these from entering us in the first place, things like our skin, hairs, stomach acid and so on. If a pathogen gets past these defences and into our bodies, our white blood cells need to identify them and fight them off. If this doesn't happen, the pathogen will be able to reproduce and cause the disease. The human immune system has two main types of white blood cell. The first type are called phagocytes. They respond to all foreign cells in the same way, so we describe them as non-specific. Phagocytes ingest and then kill, using enzymes, cells that they recognise as foreign. However, they do not recognise all potential pathogens. The second type of white blood cell are called lymphocytes. Every cell has certain molecules on its surface that are specific to that type of cell. These are called antigens and can be used to recognise particular types of cell. Lymphocytes produce molecules called antibodies that attach to these antigens. The cell with the antigen that fitted the antibody is then destroyed. Because antigens are specific to the type of cell they are found on, they each require a different type of antibody. If your white blood cells are unable to produce an antibody that fits the antigen of a pathogen, it will not be recognised and will not be destroyed. Rather than produce large volumes of all possible antibodies at all times, lymphocytes instead wait until an antigen that it recognises appears and then increases the amount of a relevant antibody that it's producing. This graph shows what happens to the level of antibody in blood during an infection. A short time, known as the lag time, after the antigen is introduced, the level of antibody in the blood increases. Because this destroys the pathogen carrying the antigen, there is no longer the need for such a high level of antibodies, and so the lymphocytes stop producing them as much. However, memory lymphocytes store the ability to make these antibodies, so that when the pathogen infects the same person again, the response, in terms of the amount of antibody produced, is much greater and more rapid than it was for the primary or first infection. This means the pathogen will be overwhelmed and destroyed before it can take hold and cause the full-blown disease again. This explains why so many diseases, such as chickenpox, we only get once. The second time we're infected with the pathogen, the antigens on it are recognised very quickly and a large amount of antibody produced to help fight it off. This happens quickly before the pathogen is able to produce the disease. So, if our immune system has previously been exposed to a particular antigen, it's much more able to fight off future infections because of the memory lymphocytes that were produced after the primary infection. This explains how immunisation or vaccination works. Rather than wait to be infected with a pathogen, a harmless version of the pathogen or the antigen material from the pathogen is injected into someone. The antigens cause an immune response and the lymphocytes produce antibodies to recognise and remove the injected material. No disease is caused as the pathogen was either not present or not active. Memory lymphocytes are also then produced by the person which will provide a rapid and strong response to future infections, preventing the person ever getting the disease. Their immune system has been trained to react in the same way as someone who has previously had the disease. Vaccination was developed by Edward Jenner. At the time, smallpox was one of the most deadly diseases around. He noticed that milkmaids, who often contracted a similar but far less deadly disease called cowpox, very rarely contracted smallpox. He suggested that cowpox could somehow protect the cowmaids from smallpox. To test his theory, he injected pus from a cowpox victim into a young boy called James Phipps. James contracted cowpox as expected and recovered. Jenner then collected pus from a smallpox victim and injected this into James Phipps also. James did not contract smallpox, showing that his body was now immune to the disease. 
We now know this is because the antigens found on the smallpox and cowpox virus are very similar, so that the memory lymphocytes produced in response to the cowpox infection were able to produce antibodies that recognised and helped to fight off smallpox. Understanding the risks and advantages to immunisation is very important. This has been highlighted in recent years by the MMR controversy, where a flawed report made some people doubt the safety of a vaccine that provided protection against measles, mumps and rubella, three very dangerous childhood diseases. As this graph shows, following the report published in 1998, fewer children received the MMR vaccine as people worried about the risks involved in taking the vaccine. However, within a few years, cases of measles, which had almost disappeared in the UK due to vaccination, began to increase rapidly as fewer children were protected against it. These are the real risks and advantages to immunisation. Mostly, the risks involve short-term discomfort in the form of swelling or redness around the site of vaccination. It's possible to develop some mild forms of the symptoms associated with the disease that you're gaining protection from. In very rare cases, a child could suffer an allergic reaction to the vaccination. Balanced against these are the known advantages, the most obvious being that a child is becoming immune to a disease without having to suffer from it in the first place. There is far, far less chance of any lasting harm being caused when compared to the risk of contracting one of the diseases in question. Finally, the more people in a population who are vaccinated against a disease, the better protected any individuals who have not received the vaccine become. This is because there are fewer people contracting the disease and then able to pass it on. This is known as herd immunity. Antibodies, as we have seen, are specific to an antigen. This means that if we have an antibody and it binds to a cell, that cell must have a specific antigen present on it. Because cells have different antigens on them, we can use this as a way of identifying and targeting specific types of cells, such as cancers. The idea is that an antibody specific to an antigen only found on cancer cells will attach itself to that cancer cell, which would allow doctors to identify the cancer and also to target the treatment to those cells. For this to work, a large number of identical antibodies are needed, and these are known as monoclonal antibodies. We know that antibodies are produced by lymphocytes, however unfortunately, once a lymphocyte starts to produce antibodies, it becomes a B lymphocyte and no longer divides. This means we're left with a single cell producing the antibodies we need. We need a cell that produces the antibodies required and that also divides to make more similar cells to also produce these antibodies. The answer is to fuse a cell that divides quickly and repeatedly, specifically a cancer cell, with a B lymphocyte. The next problem is making sure that the B lymphocyte is producing the antibody you want, whether it's one to recognise cancer cells or to identify a compound in a pregnant woman's urine to act as a pregnancy test. This is how it's done. A mouse is injected with the antigen that you want to a test to be able to identify. So in the case of a pregnancy test, HGH is the compound formed or found in the urine of pregnant women, but not non-pregnant women. Injecting this antigen causes the mouse's immune system to produce B lymphocytes that are making antibodies specific to HGH. A cancer cell is taken from a culture grown in a lab and the two cells are fused together to make what is called a hybridoma cell. The word hybridoma comes from hybrid, meaning joining together, and melanoma, which is another word for cancer. These hybridomas have a property of rapid and continual cell division from the cancer cells, but are also able to produce the antibody in the same way the B lymphocyte did. These hybridomas then produce the monoclonal antibodies that can be used to identify the presence of the antigen that was first injected into the mouse. This process will need to be repeated to produce a different type of hybridoma for each antigen that you need to be able to identify. In summary then, the human immune system uses white blood cells called lymphocytes to produce antibodies in response to the antigens found on pathogens. After an initial exposure to an antigen, whether through an infection or a vaccination, 
The body produces memory lymphocytes but are able to produce antibodies quicker when the same antigen is detected again, acting as a protection to a secondary infection. Monoclonal antibodies are used to identify specific antigens. They are produced by fusing a B lymphocyte that's producing the antibody you want with a cancer cell to create a hybridoma. These are useful in identifying cancers and then targeting treatment to these cells and also in pregnancy tests.